Well, good morning and happy Sabbath as you're coming in. Welcome to the Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist Church. Happy Thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but amongst the many things that I am thankful for, I am thankful to be here worshiping together. I want to invite you as we open up our service uh, to stand with me. We are going to uh, just bring our thanksgiving to the Lord today in song. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There's another in the fire Another in the waters Pulling back the seas Should I never need reminding Of how I've been set free There's a cross that bears the burden Another died for me There's another in the fire Dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I will bow to the things of this world Never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding? The power set me free. There is a grave that holds no body. Now the power lives in is another in the fire between all the things unseen and this reckoning I know I will never be alone I know I will never be alone there's another in the fire standing next to me be another in the water Pulling back the seas Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the 
joy in every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Another in the fire Oh, there's another in the fire another in the fire oh, there's another in the fire oh. Lord we praise you because wherever we are we give thanks to you because we know that you are with us in it We are here today to give voice to our thanksgiving. We are here today to recognize how good you are. And we pray, Lord, that you would show up in power as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody, have a seat for just a second. Welcome to the Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist Church. I just wanted to... Wish all of you a beautiful Sabbath day. Um, it's, it's been a beginning of a busy holiday season, so it's our Sabbath to be able to take a breath and just pause. So I think what we need to practice doing is just taking a deep breath in. Everybody breathe in. And then breathe out. And just relax and feel the presence of God. Let's try it again. Breathe in. And then breathe out. Let's get this attitude of relaxation and rest with God today. Um, I have one big announcement. It's in your bulletin. We have a walk-through live nativity scheduled for December 9 and 10 here in the church. It's going to be Friday night and Saturday night. And we need as many volunteers as possible. We're a little short. Um, so Sarah Smith is in the back, and she's, she's taking volunteers to be actors and helpers and everything else. So please volunteer for that. It's a wonderful thing. You don't have to do both nights. Just one night is perfectly fine. Kids are welcome to join, too. It's just a fun family night. Um, just look in the bulletin. It's going to be Friday and Saturday, December 9 and 10, so please volunteer. It's time for us to welcome each other. So everybody stand up, and I want you to give a thanks to somebody. Thank them for helping in the church. Thank them for being kind to you. Thank them for saying hello, whatever that may be. Just thank somebody today. So everybody stand up and welcome each other. Thank you for playing your guitar. Thank you for being a good wife. Thank you for being a good mother.
Well, I am so glad that we are together as a church family. So glad that you are excited to see one another. I want to invite you back to where you uh, have your family or friends. I want to invite you to stand when you get there or if you're already there as we continue to sing praises to our Lord and Savior The more I 
Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Our scripture reading this morning is Mark 10, 46 through 52. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great and a great crowd, and Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, He sprang up and came to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Good morning. If you'd uh, care to join us in prayer this morning, uh, I would invite you, if you would like to come up into the garden of prayer, or if you would like to stay where you are, if you want to kneel, if you want to sit, whatever just uh, feels right for you. You know, that last song was just, uh, I don't know, just uh, the words of that were just so great. You know, God knows our name. He knows where you are in this place. He knows, uh, you know, whatever season that you might be in this morning. Maybe you're feeling pain, maybe sorrow, maybe sadness, or maybe this morning you're just filled with inexplicable joy. Uh, uh, But whatever burden that you might have this morning, I would just ask you to give it to God this morning and let him have that. Let him have that burden, and uh, we'll just offer up a praise to him. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, and we we thank you for this time of thanksgiving. We would ask, Father, that uh, just to lift those burdens from those people that uh, might be feeling sad. Uh, Maybe they're feeling pain. Maybe they're just feeling down. Uh, Sometimes the holidays are kind of a rough season for folks as we... uh, you know, think about things that we miss, you know, as we reflect back on life, Father. But uh, we just uh, we just give you those hurts and those pains, Father. And we uh, just pray for your spirit and just to, to fill us with your joy and your peace, Father. And we, we thank you for that. And we just pray that you would be with us this day and just uh, guide and direct our footsteps, Father. And uh, just pray that you would just be with everyone here. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Wow, somebody's collecting money already. I haven't said anything yet. As soon as Keith Francis stands up, take out your money. Wave it around. Or put it in an envelope. Right, that's it. Maybe I should sit back down again. Our offering call, actually, the, uh, the quote, loose money, um, if not given to children's ministries, actually goes to Conference Advance uh, this week. Uh, and, of course, uh, we, uh, we want the conference to advance uh, as much as we want the uh, Santa Rosa SDA to advance. So um, that is a good thing. Now, Pastor Brad assures me that there are actually aspects of this service today which are going to be exactly the same uh, as they were last week. That is to say that you will have the same sermon. Oh, no, you didn't say that. <laughs> no, you didn't say that. <laughs> um, but yes, we are actually going to sing Showers of Blessing because, of course, we're coming towards the end of the uh, end of the year, and we uh, want to be uh, both thankful to God and also uh, cry out to God uh, for, um, uh, for the blessing for this church. Um, I see that God is uh, helping us to think carefully about this, as somebody decided it would be a good idea to break the uh, front door window. Um, so uh, that's a different kind of shower. That's a glass shower, but that wasn't quite what I had in mind when I uh, led you in the song last week. But nevertheless, we are going to sing it. First verse of, um, I think it's 195, I can't quite remember, but anyway. Uh, There shall be showers of blessing, this is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. And then you get the chorus. Just follow along with me. There shall be showers of blessing, this is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. And of course, you will also remember, because we are doing a reprise, that we sang this chorus twice. So here we go, one more time. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead. All right, children, hang on a second. We are actually going to do a prayer for our offering before we collect more money. All right, let's uh, briefly pray before Pastor Brad steps in with the children's story. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you indeed bless us and that you have promised showers of blessing. We plead, we demand that you indeed give us those showers. And we thank you that you will give us the spirit so that we can indeed demand those showers. We thank you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. And now, children, you must flee. Oh, I didn't say fleece, did I? You must now collect as much money as you can. Pastor Brad is going to give us the children's story. There's more money out there. There's more money out there. I see it. You can go get, you can go for seconds. It's like Thanksgiving, but for money. Well, thank you for your help, young ones. You're continuing to help 
support our children's ministry here at our church. I have a question for you, though, as you maybe were prepared to hear. I have a question, which is, have you ever felt like an animal before? I want to know, what kind of an animal have you felt like before? What kind of an animal? I'll, 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 you're going to get a chance. A dragon. A dragon. Wow. An octopus. An octopus. What, what kind of an animal have you felt a like? A unicorn. A, a unicorn. Oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. Has anyone else ever felt like an animal? Oh, yeah. What, what kind of an animal did you feel like? A cat. A cat? Oh. Were you, were you taking a nap in the sun? No? Okay. Oh, 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 we'll come right here. A black panther. A black panther. Oh, all right. I, I, I found a monkey. A monkey, yeah. A bear. A bear. Oh, I am so glad you said that because I just earlier this week felt like a bear. I felt like a grizzly bear. Grizzly bears are amazing because grizzly bears eat and eat and eat and eat. And then they sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? A grizzly bear eats and eats and eats and then it takes a special kind of nap for five to seven months sometimes. That's a long nap, isn't it? Does anyone ever nap for more than an hour? I mean, maybe I should start earlier for your parents. Has anyone ever napped? <laughs> Different answers from the front and then the back. Uh, maybe two hours you've napped, maybe three or four hours. Maybe you napped all day in the car, but a grizzly bear. You're going to get a cheetah? Excellent. <laughs> I felt like a grizzly bear this week. Oh, oh, sorry, Sebastian, what kind of animal did you feel like? I felt like an octopus. An octopus. Oh, oh okay. Two more. A deer. A deer. A deer, too. A deer, too. I felt like a grizzly bear this week because I ate and I ate and I ate for Thanksgiving. And then I got another plate and I ate and I ate and I ate. And then I got another plate and I put pie on that plate. And then I ate and ate. And then I got another plate and I put pie on that plate with whipped cream and I ate and I ate and I ate. And all I wanted to do was be like a grizzly bear and sleep. That's one of my favorite things to do on Thanksgiving. I don't know about you guys. I don't know if you're Thanksgiving nappers. But on Thanksgiving, I like to be a grizzly bear. The thing I love about a grizzly bear is a grizzly bear is able to sleep for so long because they have all of the food that they need for their rest provided to them. The Bible says that God provides for the lilies of the field, the birds of the air, I would suggest even the bears of the forest. And you know what's incredible? I love this about Thanksgiving. People are so kind. They provide mom, my moms and grandmas and, and in-laws and everyone. They're so kind. They provide food for me so that I can rest and sleep. And I know they appreciate so much that I nap instead of help with the dishes. <laughs> but you know what the, being a grizzly bear reminds me of most? It reminds me of how there is someone who provides for us that if we choose to trust in him we can find rest jesus says this very special promise come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and i will give you rest so whether you are an octopus a unicorn a dragon a grizzly bear or just a kid you can trust that Jesus will provide for you.
and you can find rest in him. Thank you for listening to my story. You can go back to your seats. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Thanksgiving. It is a blessing to worship with you. I'm so glad that you are here. I hope that today you feel a little bit at home, a little bit of that grizzly bear rest. I'll admit to you this week that I dug into the archives because the, the grizzly bear in me uh, was busy eating and did a little less sermon prepping. So this is an invitation to be kind. I, perhaps like you, get excited for Thanksgiving. And, and there are different ways that I get excited for Thanksgiving. One of the ways that I get excited for Thanksgiving is I take a very careful look at the TV schedule so that I know precisely what football games I need to watch and when they happen. The second thing that I do to prepare for Thanksgiving is I take a TV assessment of the house because in my family, everybody watches the Thanksgiving parade. Maybe some of you are parade people. That's okay. I forgive you. Uh, For me, I know I've got to find a TV that is not in competition for the parade. So that is my Thanksgiving morning tradition. The second thing that I do on Thanksgiving to to prepare for it is that I fast on Thanksgiving. Uh, It's my, my firm decision. I don't eat anything for breakfast. I don't, I don't snack throughout the day. I don't have lunch. Whenever the Thanksgiving meal is, whatever it is, 3 o'clock or 5 o'clock, that is the first morsel of food that is going to pass through my mouth on that day because I want to take full advantage of the meal. I don't know how you get excited about Thanksgiving. I don't know how you prepare, but our story today comes in from us in Mark chapter 10. And there is someone who is excited for the arrival of Jesus in our story. Scripture tells us in Mark chapter 10, if you have a Bible, open it up. It, it, it is going to be on an app on your phone. It's going to be on the screen. It might even be in the bulletin this week. It's in the bulletin this week. The Bible is coming at you. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Jesus said to him, go your, fi- go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is one of my favorite stories in scripture. You, you probably, if you've been around for any length of time, maybe even have heard me preach about this story before, because Bartimaeus is a outright Hero. But I find Bartimaeus' story to be confusing. Here is a blind man on the on the side of the road in Jericho crying out to Jesus for mercy. And when he cries out, the people with Jesus rebuke him and tell him to be silent. What? 
Yeah, exactly. I thought someone said, what? You got to it before me. That's crazy to me. Because I, I, I just want to submit to you that why, if you are following Jesus and you see someone who is obviously disabled, would you not want that person to get to Jesus? That, that, that only makes sense to me as I, as I read the story. And, and so as I'm puzzling through the story, I, I, I begin to try to ask myself, okay, what is happening here? Why is the crowd responding to this blind man in this way? Maybe it is that, that the people around the man, they don't have any faith. Maybe they lack faith. Maybe, maybe they hear a blind man crying out and they don't have a concept that Jesus, this person that they are nearby, is able to, is capable of restoring his sight, healing him. Maybe it's just simply they don't get it. They don't understand. And yet, you will notice Mark chapter 10 this is the end of Mark's stories about the miracles of Jesus. If you read through the, the book of Mark, you will find miracle after miracle from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 10. But, but starting in chapter 11, Jesus, the entirety of the book, is Jesus in Jerusalem before his death on the cross. This is, in fact, one of the very last miracles in the book of Mark. So in Mark's story, there is every reason that everybody in the crowd that is following Jesus knows what Jesus can do. In fact, if you flip back the pages just a little bit, you find the same crowd with Jesus as he is healing people elsewhere because they are on, for a few chapters in Mark, the same journey to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. So it isn't a lack of faith that has a bunch of people telling a blind man, rebuking the blind man, and telling him to be silent when he calls out to Jesus. So what is it? Maybe it is cruelty. In Jesus' day, anybody that had a, a disability, the, the, the sort of popular opinion was that you were disabled. You had some kind of chronic illness because you were ill-favored by God. God had cursed you because you were some kind of terrible person. That was the, the belief. In fact, at another place in the book of John, Jesus is walking through Jerusalem. He sees another blind man. And his disciples ask him, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he is blind? So there was a concept in that day that your disfigurement, your, your impairment, your disability, your sickness, it came as a direct result of your sin or God's lack of favor for you. And perhaps that was the case for some of them. But I would submit to you that more so than a lack of faith, for which maybe there were a couple of newbies in the crowd, more so than, than, a, than a, a sense of cruelty towards someone who is blind, but certainly there were those, I would suggest to you that more than anything else, what compelled the people to speak to this blind man in such a way was fear. Because certainly, even if you are cruel, there is, should be some motivating factor to just say, hey, I know this person is terrible, but I want to see something cool. I want to see a miracle. Even that, that surely would help some people. I would suggest to you fear <clears throat> was at the heart of their decision-making process. They are in the city of Jericho. In Jesus' day, Jericho was the vacation home, it was the winter palace of someone named King Herod. To fill in the blanks a little bit, the, the Romans ruled over Palestine and Judea where Jesus lived during his life, and they had a sort of puppet king <coughs> called Herod and his descendants, who ruled Judea and the Jews on behalf of Rome. 
And he went very much out of his way to proclaim publicly as often as he could his adherence to his devotion to Rome. There are archaeological digs in Jericho today that you can go find that that are part of his winter palace and they are filled with depictions of the glory of Rome. Here, in the middle of the city where the king who is put into power by Rome resides is someone else shouting in a public place in front of a crowd, Son of David! David is the king, the real king of the Jews. The one that they always talk about. The one the prophecies say is coming back to deliver them from the Romans. This, this is the person, the, the, the son of David is the person that they have had, and this is true, countless rebellions on behalf of. When Jesus was growing up in Galilee, there was a famous rebellion in which two or three thousand Jews rose up because they believed they had found someone who was the son of David. And they rebelled against the Romans. They rebelled against Herod. And so the Roman soldiers came in, killed them all, put them, 3,000 of them, on crosses all along the roads of Galilee, covered them with pitch, and used them as torches to light the roads at night. (coughs) This was the norm. This was normal. And in fact, in the Roman Empire, a, a crowd of people making any kind of noise in any city of the empire would be at risk of soldiers suggesting that they were starting a rebellion and coming in and dealing with them most harshly. And here they are, the middle of Jericho, the soldiers all around, in the shadow of the king's palace, and this blind man, Bartimaeus, is shouting, Son of David, have mercy on me. And you can see the people's fear. What did he say? Is he saying, Son of... Does he know? Tell him to... Is there anyone... And you can feel the fear building in the crowd as they begin to look over their shoulders wondering, is there any soldiers who are overhearing this man shouting? You can can get a sense of what is happening in the crowd as they, they rebuke him. They're saying, what are you doing? Shh, don't you know what they'll do to us? And so in the face of fear, the the crowd rebukes this blind man to the point where they would have him not even cry out to Jesus. And Jesus hears him and stops. And and I I want you to, if, if we go no further today, I want you to know that when we cry out to Jesus, our cries bring him to a stop. When when you are at your worst. When things are darkest, when the tears don't stop falling, when the news is as bad as it has ever been, and you cry out, know that Jesus stops. He speaks to those around him, saying, call him. Not only does Jesus stop when we cry out to him, In spite of what the people around us might say, Jesus calls back. He he hears our call, and, and he calls back. Call him, he says. They called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you. I would say to you this morning, whatever you may be going through, whatever brought you here, do not be afraid to get up to take heart. Jesus is even now calling you. And I want you to notice the response of Bartimaeus. This guy is amazing. He's a legend. 
But Bartimaeus is, by the way, not even his name. Bar Timaeus in the Hebrew language, in the, in the language of the day, Bar just means son of, Timaeus just means his father's name. They are just calling him son of Timaeus. He doesn't even have a core identity. He doesn't have a name of his own. And yet Jesus stops and calls him. And when Jesus calls, notice what he does. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up. And if you'll allow me to enrich the text just a little bit, and ran to Jesus. Because if you throw away your cloak and you spring to your feet, you definitely don't do a... <laughs> right? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. He threw off his cloak, he springs to his feet, and he runs to Jesus. I would remind you, he is blind. <laughs> He is blind. I, I can't tell you how often I come into my house and I, I take off jackets and I put down keys and wallets and they disappear. This blind man, when Jesus calls, throws off his cloak. He's, he's never finding that again. Not unless Jesus does something. To you and me, maybe a cloak seems like a small thing, but understand in the days of Jesus, a cloak was an incredibly valuable possession. In fact, there were rules that the Roman soldiers had to follow that included that they were not allowed to take someone's cloak from them. This is how valuable the possession was, that, that the Roman government said to the people that they were ruling over, it's just too inhumane to take someone's cloak, so there was a law against it. This is not just some everyday Jewish individual walking through. This is a blind man begging, and he throws off what is surely his most valuable possession because it is in some small way preventing him from getting to Jesus further. He, he springs to his feet, runs with abandon to Jesus. I, I, I would suggest to you that if you are calling out to Jesus, that you would let nothing stand in your way. No matter how valuable it might be, no matter how dangerous it may seem, I think we can look at blind Bartimaeus throwing away his most valuable possession, putting aside personal risk, sprinting through, by the way, not an empty marketplace, a crowd to Jesus. He arrives before Jesus, and Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? It seems an obvious question, doesn't it? And yet, I would suggest to you that this is Jesus keeping us, keeping Bartimaeus involved. Jesus is not a person of force. He is not a person who is going to compel you irresistibly to do as you as he wills, he, not even to your benefit. And so he asks the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. It's okay to ask Jesus for what you need. To, to make the request because what, what is unbelievable here, what is demonstrated clearly in the story of Bartimaeus, is that Jesus' request is that we make our requests to him. That's what he wants. What do you want? What do you need? 
Rabbi, he says, let me recover my sight. Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Gratitude is an interesting thing. This is a time of gratitude, a season of thanksgiving. And I would suggest to you that gratitude is highly contextual. When I do something kind for my children, I, I get them a cookie, I, I take them somewhere nice, I, I want, I'm looking for a particular kind of gratitude, perhaps a word of thanks, maybe some additional obedience for a handful of minutes around bedtime, maybe a, a piece of art given with a full heart, maybe even a hug. All these things would, would be wonderful. They're, they're the sort of gratitude that I, I desire from my children. I think about the kind of gratitude that I would receive from people here in our church. Words of gratitude are certainly something that I appreciate. And in fact, I would tell you that the, the thing that I most appreciate are words of gratitude that come after a long interval those make a big difference to me. I was my first pastorate, my first time being a pastor, South Dakota. I studied with a, a, a woman there for several weeks, and, and then life happened as it does, and never finished. I moved, she, she got busy or started a new job, and just never finished. I hadn't, hadn't even had contact with her for, for years, and about seven years later, I got a message on Facebook from that same person letting me know that she had been baptized and she wanted to say thank you because that process had started seven years ago with the two of us. And that, man, that hit me like, whoa. The, the words of gratitude with a long interval, they are especially meaningful. However... There are some gratitudes that I wouldn't want from my children, right? I, I don't want a long interval from them. I, I don't want to take them to Disneyland and then hear 12 years later, Dad, I really appreciated that. <laughs> I, I don't want them to convey their, their greetings by Facebook or text message. I, I want the hug. From my wife, my gratitude, the gratitude I need is simple. A, a smooch is all that is necessary. <laughs> gratitude is contextual. Most of you shouldn't give me your artwork. <laughs> Most of you. If you're thinking, is he talking about me? I'm talking about you. <laughs> Less of you should offer smooches. In this time of gratitude, of thanksgiving, I, I think it's important for us to ask the question here of this story. How do we convey gratitude to Jesus? The, the blind man has this amazing thing done for him. His sight is recovered. How do we convey thanksgiving to him in a way that makes sense to Jesus? in a way that is appropriate for him. And I would suggest to you that we see in Bartimaeus a final example worthy of following. Yes, when, when, we, when, when, when we approach Jesus, when Jesus calls us, when we pray to him, we should come with abandon. We should let nothing stand in our way. But I think Bartimaeus also tells us how to be thankful to Jesus. Jesus, after healing him, says to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. He, he gives him freedom. I, I've answered your request. I've blessed you. I've taken care of what needed taken care of. You are free to do as you will. Imagine that. Imagine that. Like, even the pastor requires a shake of the hand after, after offering a sermon. But Jesus... Upon restoring sight to this man, asks for nothing. Go your way. Go your way. 
I would suggest to you, Bartimaeus reveals that it is the best form of gratitude we can give to Jesus to offer our freely chosen decision to follow him day by day. Immediately, Mark says, not after an interval, not after considering it, not after going back home, not after going to find his cloak, immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Will you offer Jesus gratitude today? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for many things. We thank you for personal things. Maybe that is the family that we had the opportunity to reconnect with this week. Maybe that was a day to breathe. Maybe that was a kind word unexpectedly received. Lord, maybe it was unexpected comfort in the midst of harrowing grief. Today, Lord, we offer you from a hundred different places and a hundred different perspectives the gratitude you richly deserve. We choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath. Have a blessed weekend.